volunteers and pioneers in association with Sempra LNG. But the great thing is we don't stop with just regasification. We're looking at regional distribution. We're looking at LNG to power opportunities, bunkering, barging, uh, truck loading facilities, anything we can do to spread that LNG footprint out in a given market. Welcome to LNG TV and today's episode of Frontiers and Pioneers. We are joined by Wavecrest Energy CEO, Rob Bringleson. A seasoned gas and LNG executive, Rob's career has spanned senior roles with Enron and El Paso before co-founding Accelerate Energy in 2003, where he went on to spend 11 years as CEO. We are delighted to have Rob with us and to share more about his latest venture, Wavecrest Energy. Rob, a pleasure to have you with us. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Rob, tell us more then about this new venture, Wavecrest. Great, thank you. Um, Wavecrest is an integrated LNG platform. We're formed with the backing of Macquarie Capital, and we're looking to bring energy where it's needed most around the world. So the way we do that is with a focus on LNG regasification. And we're primarily looking at Asian and Latin American markets for that. But the great thing is we don't stop with just regasification. We're looking at regional distribution. We're looking at LNG to power opportunities, bunkering, barging, uh, truck loading facilities, anything we can do to spread that LNG footprint out in a given market. Uh, the way we look at it as well is we're not linked to any particular solution or asset or anything that we own, we're looking at what the best solution is for a project. So if that's a floating solution, if it's land-based, if it's some hybrid solution between the two, that's great. Whatever is the best solution for a project is what we'll pursue. So where we're looking at things, we're looking at early to mid-stage development opportunities where we can bring development capital to a market, help a project get to final investment decision, and then subsequently put equity capital in for construction. Uh, but we're more than just capital on any of these projects. With the Macquarie backing, we bring in the ability to uh, provide financial advisory services, debt structuring, even commodity for projects that need it. But the great thing is we don't have to do that on every project. Those are the tools that we have for us. So we can find, again, whatever the best solution is for a given project. And how is it, how's it going so far, um, the, the inception of a new company? Uh, great to have Macquarie involved. Uh, it is. It's fantastic to have their backing. Uh, we are set up as operationally separate. And that means we have to have our own systems ranging everything from IT through payroll, uh, through accounting and so forth. So it's been a lot of setup getting all those in place as it always is with a startup company. Um, so that's been quite busy for us, getting that up and running. And we've uh, been sharing our time with that, really trying to focus on the business as well and looking at a lot of project opportunities. So we've looked at probably 20 to 25 different opportunities, um, have five of those on our priority list that we're pursuing now and trying to move forward. So you gave a fantastic introduction to Wavecrest and the fact that you're looking at the breadth of the downstream value chain. Um, perhaps what are some of the things that you're looking for and what's going to really differentiate projects that are going to stand out for you? Well, for us, we're looking at such a broad variety of things. I wouldn't say there's any one particular type of project that stands out for us. What we're looking for is projects that not only have a good initial opportunity, but the potential for longer term growth. So reaching out further into the markets and expanding uh, what we can do with those projects. Um, on one end of the spectrum, we're looking at a very large uh, LNG to power project, uh, which has a total capital cost of about three and a half to four billion dollars. And on the other end of the spectrum, we're looking at some small regional distribution um, LNG regasification opportunities that might only be 150 to 200 million in total capital. Um, so really what we're looking for are those projects that we feel are well positioned um, and that we can get across the line, bringing all the experience and expertise that, uh, that the team I've put together has with the financial capability and backing and, and terrific resources I have available through Macquarie. We here at LNG TV are, are very big advocates of the energy transition and specifically the role of gas and LNG within that. Um, something I was particularly curious about was, I mean, are there instances or are there opportunities for some of the projects that you're involved with to actually support the development of renewables and clean energy infrastructure? There are, uh, and that's that's actually a great, uh, a great uh, question to ask because when we're looking at these projects, we realize that LNG has to walk hand in hand with renewable solutions. And by developing, for instance, a large LNG to power project in a given location, we can be an anchor customer for a transmission line. And that transmission line being built allows renewable projects to connect into that and have a much easier time getting to market. 
We also work very well by providing the stability and the baseload power needed uh, to support renewables as more and more built-in countries transition that direction. Uh, much of what we're looking at is bringing gas into markets to replace oil or coal as a power source. So we also see that we have a tremendous benefit there from an emissions reduction perspective. Reflecting a bit more on your career personally, um, you've been with Enron, Accelerate, now Wavecrest, your second startup, um, all very entrepreneurial. Um, how do you reflect on it, particularly your time with Accelerate, those 11 years as CEO? Well, I think one of the things I said probably about five or six years into Accelerate was I would never do a startup again. Um, and I, I say that a little tongue in cheek and that it is, is difficult and those first few years are tough. but. Uh, it is also a tremendous amount of fun. Um, so I look back at, at my time with Accelerate with, with a lot of pride and, and, and fondness for what we did. And actually a lot of uh, thanks for the uh, all the support that we had from our backers there to let us move into new markets and do new things. So every new country we went into, every new project we explored was a, a different adventure. Most of them were places that had never seen LNG. Um, so we always had great stories coming in about uh, navigating the permitting process or finding the right partners and project sites. And um, each of those was really exciting. But one of the things I, I think I remember most is uh, on every project, we would say this project's really been difficult. When it's done, we're really going to celebrate. And right about the time the project would get done, we'd be deep into the next project. Then we'd say, OK, next time we'll celebrate. And you get 10 or 12 projects down the road and you realize you never really stopped to, to take a breath and celebrate things. But, but that was the fun part of it. We were so busy. And then COVID and, comes uh, along and you never get to celebrate. <laughs> well, that's that's right. You never do. But uh, it, it's great, though. I mean, we the, I really uh, had, had a great time with the team we had there, built a tremendous team. Um, and I was fortunate enough to pull two of those uh, people over to work with me here when I started it that uh, just have fantastic experience. But no, all in all, it was it was terrific. We were doing things that honestly, at the beginning, a lot of industry incumbents didn't want to see us do by opening up markets for FSRUs and um, kind of changing the uh, changing the way the industry looked at things. But over time, it really became a pretty strong business. And I think we did a lot of good for uh, the countries we helped. So definitely look back on it with a lot of fondness. So all that experience with Accelerate, how much did that help them when it came to Wavecrest? Yes, I mean, without a doubt, you, you learn from your past mistakes uh, only so you can make new ones. Uh, but, <laughs> Uh, there's there's a lot we learned from it, and um, I think mostly it's it's just getting the right team around you, getting the right people in place to do things, who who really know how to get things done, and uh, and can look and see where the company is now, where it needs to be, and figure out how to get there. So sort of staying with um, so all of that experience um, at Accelerate as an FSR you you developer, um, you know, would you? have a different lens or are you bringing a different lens to considering projects and looking at the world now you're more of a sort of a broader downstream project developer sort of slash investor? We do. We look at look at things very differently now. Um, as an FSRU provider and someone who had to put those assets to work, um, every project looked like it needed an FSRU and every place where there was another FSRU provider, it was competition or we would, we had already lost the market because they had a project there. Now, when we look at it, um, we're not competing with any of those companies. We're actually coming in and helping enable the project. So our scope got much bigger. We also don't have to stop at the FSRU. We can look further down into the markets. And frankly, working with Macquarie, we can look further back upstream, whether that's looking all the way back up uh, to liquefaction or um, shipping in between or LNG supply. Those aren't specifically in our business, but Macquarie has the capability there. So it really lets us look at an integrated project from end to end if we want to, uh, but also opens up the opportunities in any of those downstream markets to look at any technology, work with really any partner. And uh, it's it's refreshing. It's, it's a much bigger universe we can work in now. It would be remiss of me not to mention um, Kathleen Eisbrenner, who obviously sadly passed in 2019. For those who never had the opportunity to get to know her or ever work with her, um, you know, what are some of your memories of her and what do you think her legacy for the LNG industry will be? Well, my uh, first move into LNG was working for Kathleen back in, I think, 2000. And I had come to El Paso Corporation and wanted to work in their uh, power group. And they literally forced me to interview with Kathleen <laughs> because I didn't want to be in LNG. I knew nothing about it um, at the time. 
I started working for her then, and she was probably the best idea person and marketer I've ever worked with. Um, she would throw out a barrage of ideas and always they came with the why not? Because you people people would you know naturally want to try to do things the way they've done them for 10 or 20 years or their whole careers. And when she'd say, why not? It really made people think, well, yeah, why not? And so we would spend hours uh, a week just kicking around ideas, thinking about strategies. And uh, that was something I really missed when she moved on from Accelerate uh, in her career. But I would say it was really her drive and her her force of will to move forward on on floating regasification that, that kicked the industry off. Um, I will tell you, I was not a fan of it. I was working on land-based terminals for El Paso, looking at the uh, Altamira project in, in uh, Mexico and looking at uh, uh, another project out on the West Coast. And I thought land-based was the only solution. And, and she convinced me and, and really got behind it and drove it. So I think her legacy is really creating an entirely new aspect of the industry um, and getting people to think about the markets a lot differently and not worry so much when, when people in the market tells, to markets tell you you're crazy. I mean, they said that to us when we started looking at the one of our first import projects in Kuwait, that nobody could understand why in the world you'd import LNG into Kuwait. And then I think 18 months to two years later, uh, there were four plus cargoes a month coming into the project in Kuwait to displace oil. So um, things like that, I, I really think, you know, at the, at the outset of, of Accelerate and really getting us to think about things in a more creative and, and a little bit crazy manner was what really mattered. And I think to be a developer, uh, and to move these projects along, you have to be a little bit crazy. You, you, because it's it's too hard, and there are a lot easier things to do in the world than uh, working in some far flung country that's never dealt with LNG. Um, and you're trying to do everything from create new laws to get uh, tax rules written and and everything else just to get your project kicked off. Are you a crazy leader? Because I want to I want to know what your leadership <laughs> style is. Um, <laughs> Because you built companies, yeah. projects, and obviously teams of people. So how do you, what's your motto for leadership? Well, I, th I think the, the most important thing I go by is take the work seriously. Don't take yourself seriously. Um, it's too hard. You spend too many hours a day with people. And if you can't have a good laugh with the people who are around you and a good laugh at yourself, then what's the point of it all? And that's a lot of time. The only keep, the only thing that keeps you from, from going crazy in the middle of a project when uh, when everything's moving sideways on you or you have some problem, you've got to be able to, to laugh a little bit and keep going. So that that was probably the biggest thing that, that uh, I look at. Um, you know, a couple of other things that are really important to me when I think about building the team and building the company, um, I want people who are going to speak up. And I mean that in a respectful and a productive way, but forcefully, if you really think there's a problem. Too many times we've had uh, problems in the industry with people not saying something when they saw an issue. So that's uh, really critical for me. And just the ability for those teams to, to mesh together. I, I don't like to, to segregate um, my different groups within a company. When we had technical and development and operations and finance, I wanted to be able to walk into a room and see all those people working together and not being able to pick out who was on which team, but everybody comes together and, and pulls in for whatever's needed. So those are kind of the, some of the big things for me I look at when we're, we're building back up here. And specifically the role of CEO, um, you know, it's something that a lot of people aspire to. Um, do you think that there are things that you can do to prepare or is it a role that no one can ever truly prepare for? You just have to learn along the way. Yeah, I, I think it's more the latter. I, I, don't, I don't think I could even prepare somebody for it. It's pretty much whatever needs to get done, you have to make sure it gets done. And it's not the glamour job. I mean, when I was a kid, I thought, hey, being the CEO, I get to wear a tie to work and I'm going to sit in a big office, put my feet on the desk, uh, go home early and go to parties all the time. And it's going to be terrific. And it ends up being, yeah, fantastic dinner sitting on airplanes, uh, working out of the hotel room, um, doing whatever job needs to get done with it. And it's rarely glamorous. So um, I think everybody's got their own CEO style. And maybe I don't CEO correctly. Um, but for me, um, a big part of what I like to do is uh, make sure that I'm living by the same rules I put in place for the team. So I want, I'm not going to ask anybody to do any more or work any harder than I would. Um, I like to be involved in the business. I don't like to micromanage. I want to have a team around me that I trust and, um, and, and can get things done. And that was probably the hardest thing for me when I stepped up to be CEO was being able to trust the people who are working for me to get their jobs done and find that right line between knowing enough and not micromanaging them. So 
Um, I mean, it, that's the long-winded way of saying, no, I don't think anybody could have prepared me for it. And there were many days in that 11 years when I was running Accelerate that I would walk into the office and say, okay, what, what really is my job today? What do I need to be doing today? And we're, so, you know, a lot of people say it's, it's all strategy and vision. Well, that's important. But I think just as big, if not bigger, part of that is making sure that you provide um, the, your employees what they need to succeed. You need to clear the road for them to let them get their jobs done. So I, my job, I saw a lot of times, just take the obstacles out of the way, give them the tools they needed so they could keep working, even if it meant, and it was it can be very uh, um, unglamorous if that's the right way to say it at, at times, uh, because there are just things that need to get done. And I don't mind that. I like that. I like to, uh, I like to be hands-on in what we're doing and, and really involved with the teams. And how have you found CEOing in the last 18 months during the pandemic, being able to build up those relationships and you know, particularly with a, with a new company? Yeah, that was actually tricky because I started the discussions with Macquarie to set this up in April of last year. And so the entirety of this was done virtually. I didn't meet anyone from Macquarie until after we closed the deal. Um, and I would have never said that was possible before. Um, and then coming into it, um, I think that in part that made it a little easier to stay in touch with people. So when things were started and I started looking for, for my team and, and to start filling in, uh, it was fairly easy to get in touch with people. And, and you know, everybody had their, uh, their, their Zoom at the ready or their, their phone on their hip because they weren't around everybody in the office all the time. Um, so that, that made it a little bit easier. But honestly, um, I will say the, the two people I started with here were the two folks I had in mind the uh, within weeks after I left Accelerate as a, if I ever do this again, these are the two people I want to start with. So I, I will say I had them clearly in mind. Um, couldn't do anything about it. I had a, a rather lengthy uh, non-compete period, um, which uh, uh, if you ever have that happen, take advantage of it and have a little bit of fun instead of worrying about what your next job will be. So I spent way too much of that time thinking about what I do next. And I look back on it now and say, why didn't I clean out the garage or uh, do the 5,000 other things on my to-do list at home? So anyhow, my two cents on that. <laughs> Probably explains why you are today and why you're, you're, you're so successful. Um, just a final point on, from an organizational perspective. Um, something I'm always fascinated about is culture. And for me, it, it seems that, or well, the question that I, uh, I ponder over is whether culture is something that is truly built or, and you come with a vision, or is culture something that actually then emerges an identity for a company, emerges along the way as an organization is built? You know, what's your perspective on that? Well, I think the, the initial team definitely plants the seed for what the culture will be. And then it's a question of how you improve that and maintain it over time. So yeah, I think uh, when I came into this, there's a particular way I like to do things. Um, I'm a firm believer that um, people will work very hard um, if you let them have some fun now and then, if you uh, make it you know, clear with where they're valued and, and really promote their accomplishments and make sure that they, they get recognition. And those all seem like some, some people think see those as small things, but I, I'm really, really big on that. Uh, I used to do a lot of things. Um, every year we would do a fundraiser for the American Heart Association. And we would have every functional group in the company come up with their strategy for how to, how to raise money. And typically on a Friday afternoon, um, we, would, we would let these groups do this. So you know, at one point it was uh, beer and brats. So they grilled up some bratwurst and for $10 donation to the American Heart Association, you can get a beer and a bratwurst. Now that's not a great plug for what you should be doing for your heart. So I, I get the irony in that. Uh, but we did a lot of things like that where people really got involved. And those couple of hours just a few times a year where people could really get together, have a little fun, made a lot of difference. So I'm, I'm very big on that, um, just making sure that, that people have a little bit of fun together. You spend more time with the people in the office than you ever spend with your own family. And so, so building those relationships and, and fostering that, that camaraderie, I think is, is really important because at the end of the day, when we would do our annual evaluations of people, it was rarely how big of a deal did you close? or how many hours did you work? It was, how much of a team player were you? Did you throw in and help on another project when you didn't need to? Were you willing to stay up here you know, all night to get a proposal out because uh, the team needed the help? Were you that kind of a person or, or not? And that was the single biggest thing. So 
I'm, I'm a big believer in that and in, in having those, uh, those relationships built up inside the company. Final question, Rob, then, and this one we ask of a lot of our guests. Um, when you look back on your career, what sort of impact would you have liked to have both professionally and, and personally, I guess? Well, I, I think a lot of it, and I was fortunate to see some of this, to be able to bring energy to places that really need it. Um, and I, I can tell you one of the best feelings I ever had was after we did the two projects in Argentina when I was at Accelerate, to see on a cold winter day that almost 25% of Argentina's gas consumption was flowing across two projects that we as a company put in. There's just no feeling like that. And to say that's something tangible we did. Now, we didn't get a lot of accolades for it. There was nobody on the news saying, look what, what these guys did. We were a service provider. But when you can see that impact, that just makes makes a big difference. So professionally, that's that's really what I want to see is projects we do. Yeah, hopefully they're they're fantastic for our shareholders and our investors. Um, but more to the point, hopefully they're great for the countries we do them in and really help people where they need it. And so to do that, one of the things that that I've I've really pushed to do, and I, and I'm you know every day I'm hopeful that I I keep this uh, going is I've tried to build up a reputation of delivering on what we say we're going to do and being a very forthright and and honest company. And I think at the end of the day, that would be the best thing that could happen to me if somebody uh, at the close of my career said, great guy to work with, did what he said, always felt like I could trust him. And that's where we want to be. Now, you're going to have tough negotiations. I'm sure there'll be times when people say, boy, that guy was a real jerk in the way we had to negotiate that deal. And they really pushed us into this on this deal. And that's that's negotiations. That's not I guess that's not character. So that's that's what I, I hope that uh, you know people think about me when they work with me. And as I said, I'm sure there are people out there who think I probably negotiated too hard or uh, didn't do something the way they wanted, but that was more um, business negotiations than anything else. Well, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for some of those insights. And we wish you all the best with Wavecrest. We'll certainly be following you over the next few years. All right. Well, thanks very much. I enjoyed it and good speaking with you all. And thank you for watching our latest episode of Frontiers and Pioneers. We'll see you again soon. Frontiers and Pioneers, in association with Sempra LNG.